Hi, everyone. My name is Evans Fernandez. I'm a lone doctor for National Youth Health in Denver, Colorado. And I want to thank the very kind invitation by the uh, Vietnam Respiratory Society to speak to you about the diagnosis and management of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And we're going to break down this talk into the clinical presentation, the epidemiology of the disease. We're going to make a brief stop into the recently published clinical practice guidelines about the evaluation of the disease. And then we're going to end up talking very briefly about the management. It's important to remember that hypersensitivity pneumonitis is an immune mediated complex lung disease that occurs in susceptible patients and is triggered by repeated inhalation of and sensitization to a large variety of environmental and occupational organic antigens and less common inorganic antigens. The initial lymphocytic infiltration into the lungs may result also in uh, a granulomatous-like reaction. And a subset of patients may develop lung fibrosis, which by itself is a risk factor for disease progression and is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality among patients with HP or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. HP is not an allergic disease, it's not an atopic disease, it is not an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. And many medications and drugs have been associated with an HP-like reaction on histology and on imaging, and they need to be excluded because HP clinical presentation and clinical course can overlap with other lung diseases. A high index of suspicion is required. And the clinician should think about hypersensitivity pneumonitis whenever a patient comes to your clinic with interstitial lung disease. The incidence and prevalence of the disease appears to be influenced by the geography, the weather, and the season. And in Vietnam, because the weather is warm and humid, the concern may be that patients at risk exposed to mold and bacteria uh, may develop the disease. Occupation plays an important role. And from the epidemiological standpoint, Farmer's lawn is the most common one described in the literature. Uh, for example, from farmers being exposed to moldy hay and also among pigeon breeders. The prevalence of HP from ILD registry data from Europe, the Middle East, and Asia ranges from 2 to 47% of cases. In the US, the prevalence is about 2 to 3 cases per 100,000. HP can occur at any age. And the number of cases appears to increase with increasing age. And about half of HP cases may present with long-standing chronic disease, with about a third of half of them presenting to you with evidence of lung fibrosis on imaging. There are many antigens implicated as uh, triggering or causing hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and they're everywhere. Therefore, the importance of taking a comprehensive environmental and occupational history. They can be classified as organic antigens due to microbes or animal proteins or due to inorganic antigens. Thermophilic actinomyces contaminating hay, silage, and grain is the most common probably microorganism described in the literature and associated with the development of the most common form of the occupational form of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is farmer's lung. Bird-related hypersensitivity pneumonitis is the most common animal source of the disease, the exposure to the feathers, the droppings, and the bloom, which is a respectable uh, dust that coats the feather of the bird and is made up of keratin and immunoglobulins. It's very immunogenic. And this might explain why Small flying birds like parakeets and pigeons have been associated with the development of fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis of patients being exposed to these birds for a long time because they can release significant amount of bloom. Low molecular weight chemicals are <clears throat> pretty much everywhere in many industries, and the use of isocyanate to the manufacturing for the manufacturing of uh, polyurethane foams adhesive and paint is probably the most common inorganic antigen described in the literature. And you have to think about it 
anytime a patient presents to you with an occupational cause of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is a case of a patient with non-fibrotic HP that was published last year in CHESS that developed as a result of being exposed to a contaminated mattress and a pillow. And the patient then was advised to avoid the, uh, the source, was treated with a course of prednisone, and the patient had significant improvement as shown on the CT on the right. And this case illustrates a few important points. Number one is that the most common non work cause of HP that you will see will be due to indoor residential exposure to microbes. The other point to make here is that you need to take an exposure history that is comprehensive and you cannot stop short at asking routine questions. You need to explain to the patient what is that you're looking for in order to try to identify the source. And lastly, HP commonly represents a reaction to a multitude of inhaled antigens, not just one. Uh, that can have synergistic effects. In terms of the differential diagnosis, um, as you can see here, one thing to remember is that many patients with non-fibrotic HP may present with very mild disease that may regress when you educate the patient about staying away from that source. That's all you need to do. However, sometimes in patients with mild disease, meaning with negligible imaging or um, lung function findings, the clinician may be poised to overdiagnose, over treat those patients, and you have to be careful. On the other hand, in patients with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, one of the most common differential diagnoses is idiopathic lung fibrosis. And you don't want to misdiagnose either one. Therefore, the importance of referring these patients early on to a referral center. In terms of prognostic factors, being a man over the age of 65, having inspiratory crackles on auscultation, having a reduced lung function and or a decline in FEC or the LCO of five to 10% during the course of disease, as well as having increased fibrosis on CT or uh, histopathology is associated with poor prognosis. On the other hand, having lack of fibrosis on CT and or evidence of inspiratory mosaic attenuation is associated with a much better uh, prognosis because this patient may respond to anti-inflammatory therapy. Genomic factors, just having, such as having short telomeres or uh, the MUC5D variant have also been associated with poor prognosis. Composite measures, so uh, that combined lung function test, sex um, and age has been also uh, helpful um, to predict the course of the disease. And there are other factors. And one of the I mentioned is smoking. Smoking uh, may mitigate the incidence of the disease because nicotine appears to have suppressive effect on lymphocyte early on. However, if the patient develops lung fibrosis, patients who have more than a 20 pack year of history of smoking are at increased risk to develop further disease progression and those patients have worse prognosis and those patients need to be educated about smoking cessation. Moving into the assessment of the disease. This, were the, this was uh, the CHESS guidelines published last year, which I'm gonna invite you to please read and look. Um, the panel proposed um, 14 uh, PICO recommendations that led to 14 key action statements. Um, <clears throat> we review about 3,000 studies that were assessed according to the gray criteria. The evidence was low quality, and so we were not able to meta-analyze the evidence for any of the recommendations. Sometimes a comprehensive clinical history of exposure is not done properly or not taken because you may not have enough time <clears throat> during the clinic visit. And also, uh, this is due to other factors. But it appears that the diagnostic approach sometimes may be backwards. When the clinician is told or finds out that a surgical lung biopsy shows evidence of hypersensitivity in pneumonitis, then the doctor goes back and takes a detailed history. 
And I hope you would agree with me that this is not ideal because the identification of the inciting antigen exposure is the most important predictor of the diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It will influ influence the predictive value of, of any test that you will do, such as the CT of the chest. It is important that in addition of taking a detailed history that you use an exposure questionnaire that you give to the patient that will help improve the sensitivity of identifying the source, will improve patient recall, and most importantly, will save you time. It's also um, important, and we suggest, including an occupational medicine specialist in work-related cases for the reasons that I outlined here. In non-work-related cases, still an occupational medicine specialist that I guess you might find at a tertiary medical center uh, in, um, in Vietnam can help you determine if a home inspection is still required. And this is, would be important, especially in patients with a indeterminate inciting anti exposure and significant disease progression, or in patients in who you suspect that there may be multiple inciting anti sources. Many years ago, in the figure on the left, we show that in patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, independent of the presence or not of lung fibrosis, if you were unable to identify that inciting antigen source, those patients appear to have much more prognosis. More recently, on the capital major curves on the right, uh, our colleagues from the Mayo Clinic also look at patients with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And they found again that if the clinician was unable to identify the antigen source, or if the patient refused to avoid the antigen source, those patients had much worse survival than in patients who avoided the antigen. Given the prognostic importance of antigen identification and avoidance, we suggest not classifying that environmental and occupational history as yes or not, but based on the likelihood of an occupational inciting antigen exposure as identifiable, unidentified, or indeterminate, or which suggests that there is some evidence that suggests a temporal association between symptoms and the disease, but is not conclusive. And the overreaching goal of this is to help mitigate the, um, the often uh, premature conclusion that there is non-important inciting antigen exposure and emphasizes also the importance of asking the patient and family members at each visit about the environmental and occupational history until a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis or any other ILD then becomes more clear. We also suggest classifying the disease as fibrotic or non-fibrotic and not classifying the disease as acute, sort of acute or chronic. This classification is obsolete. The evidence invariably suggests that the extent of lung fibrosis, as I mentioned before, and the rate of change of those lung, lung fibrotic changes on imaging provide important prognostic information that can help you certify your patients. Oftentimes, the response to antigen avoidance and pharmacological therapy can be used to inform the diagnosis. However, you may not see clinical improvement with antigen avoidance if the patient has multiple exposures, if patients have severe progressive fibrotic disease, or if the remediated antigen is not the one causing the disease. Similarly, the response to medications may be very variable, especially among patients with fibrotic disease. Therefore, the lack of clinical improvement does not, to anti avoidance or anti-inflammatory therapy does not rule out the diagnosis. We also review the literature and assess the yield of the anti specific IgE test, the inhalation challenge test, and the lymphocyte proliferation test. And we found, uh, not surprisingly, the uh, literature, the evidence was poor quality, and that these are 
exposure assessment tools. They are not diagnostic tools. And we cannot recommend the routine use of any of these tests, specifically because it is unclear what is the value that this test will add beyond a positive exposure yeah, that you identify with a comprehensive history in the context of MDD, multidisciplinary discussion, when you discuss the case with your colleagues. In a low prevalence setting, in a patient in who you are unable to identify inside the anti exposure, picking and choosing what antigen you're gonna test is invariably associated with low accuracy. If you dare to use any of these tests in a patient with a known exposure, such as my patient who comes to telehealth with her nasal cannula and her burr in the shoulder, she's a bird lover. I know already what is exposure. And if that test comes back negative, the bird lover or the farmer will then tell you, see doctor, I told you so. It is not the bird, it's not the farming activities, it's not the hay that I deal with every day that is causing my disease. So you may support the patient bias towards not avoiding the exposure. We also review the literature and look at the diagnostic yield of uh, CT findings in isolation or in combination that suggests hypersensitivity and hormonitis. On the left, you can see a typical finding in a patient with non fibrotic disease, which is the presence of diffuse sentinel or nodules of ground glass opacification. In the middle, you see a CT of a patient with a three density sign, which is an umbrella term um, that suggests the combination of hyperattenuation, hypoattenuation lung zones, and normal lung zones indicating the presence of interstitial lung disease and airway center disease as seen in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Or in the right, the presence of respiratory mosaic and air trapping. And all of these findings are uh, important in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. For example, if you take the three density sign in the middle, is highly specific to help you differentiate fibrotic HP from idiopathic pulmonic fibrosis. However, none of these findings are pathognomonic. However, if you see them in the right clinical context, it can help support the diagnosis. We then took all of these imaging findings and divide them into categories, into non-fibrotic and fibrotic. And then we should divide them into typical and compatible for non-fibrotic categories and typical compatible and indeterminate for <clears throat> the fibrotic uh, categories. I'm not gonna go into any every permutation here, and you are welcome to look at this in our guidelines. However, it's important to remember that we make no emphasis in the distribution of the disease because the literature suggests that this is not critical, especially among patients with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The most common distribution is not overload predominant, it's lower load predominant and diffuse. And we make emphasis in the assessment of a small airway disease findings on imaging. We also suggest using MDD or multidisciplinary discussion for diagnostic decision making. A team approach is better than yourself in isolation. And the literature suggests that MDD provides a new or alter the persistent HP diagnosis in a substantial proportion of patients. These recommendations dive into the issue of pluralistic reasoning. In a patient with a typical inciting antigen exposure, with a typical imaging, you're done. That patient may have already hypersensitivity pneumonitis. You don't need to do any other test. It's important also to remember that the presence of BAL lymphocytosis, bronchiolar lavage lymphocytosis, is not commonly present in patients with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And so the inability to reach a 20%, 30%, 15% lymphocyte threshold does not rule out the diagnosis of fibrotic HP. These recommendations dive into the issue of when uh, to do a lung biopsy and what features do you look for. And in summary, we suggest that the lung biopsy should be done if the results will help you optimize management. Therefore, taking into account the patient preferences, the C severity and clinical course, a lung biopsy is unnecessary 
if the results will not help you guide management. Then we took all these histopathological findings from the uh, literature and we classified them into non-fibrotic and fibrotic. Suffice to say that patients with a compatible pattern, whether it's fibrotic or not, can be distinguished from a typical pattern because the compatible pattern lacks the cherry in the top of the ice cream, which is the non-necrotizing granulomas. Uh, also, of course, in the setting of uh, absence of any other explanation for the interstitial lung disease. And similar to the imaging categories, these are not final histopathological diagnosis. The goal here is, to, is for you to use these categories to help you formulate a diagnosis every time you face a patient with hypersensitivity pneumonitis and you discuss the case with your colleagues. In summary, the diagnostic approach should be patient-centered stepwise. The goal would be to go from a unidentified inciting antigen exposure on the right to identifying the source. Then you combine that exposure history with the level of CT confidence. And in patients with a compelling exposure history and a typical CT pattern for the disease, you're done. That patient has hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Any other patient has a working diagnosis, a provisional diagnosis. And in those patients, the presence of VA lymphocytosis can help you increase the level of confidence that that patient may have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But the absence of it does not rule out the disease, especially in patients with fibrotic HP. And if the preponderance of the integration of the data does not result in a confident diagnosis, advising or recommending to do a lung biopsy uh, may be helpful if the results, again, may help you optimize and guide management. In terms of therapy, we divide these into medications, supportive care, and anti avoidance. anti avoidance is the most important non-pharmacological approach known to influence positively the course of the disease and the survival. Indoor microbial contamination due to bacteria and fungi is invariably associated with poor moisture control. Therefore, source control invariably will include preventing water intrusion into the house, remediating leaks and floating, removing any uh, standing water sources such as hot tubs, vaporizers, uh, humidifiers. And it's important to keep the relative humidity below 50% as patients to get a hygrometer that can measure the humidity indoors. If the home has been affected by flooding, extensive cleanup and remediation is required, and this may uh, uh, need extra help. And there are websites that, um, as outlined here, that can provide recommendations to patients and the uh, doctors. If the patient has a bird-related HP case, removing the bird may not be sufficient. And efforts to remove the residual droppings and feathers from the house, from the ventilation system, is extremely essential. Remember that it's important to try to connect with an occupational medicine specialist in work-related cases. And if the patient is unable to avoid the inciting antigen source, uh, or if the source cannot be remediated, removing the patient from that antigen containing environment is essential, especially if they have evidence of disease progression. In terms of medications, that will depend again of the clinical presentation, the course, and patient preference. Commonly, we use anti inflammatory therapy in patients with fibroinflammatory disease, with non fibrotic disease, and in patients with an acute exacerbation of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Well, we use anti fibrotic therapy in patients with progressive fibrosin HP. In other words, after you have determined the clinical course of the disease, the severity based on lung function, based on imaging, based on symptoms, and you have educated the patient to avoid that inciting antigen, you might need to make a decision about therapy, especially if the patient continues to have a progressive course. Again, we use medications like prednisone to induce improvement. Currently, I usually use about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram for one to two weeks 
and then that is followed by a taper over four to six weeks, and then I assess the clinical response and functional response. In patients with fibrotic disease, I may use an antifibrotic. In patients that I suspect that they need a long course of prednisone, I try to use a prednisone spraying agent, such as mycophenolate, mofetil, or isatiopring, and then taper off the prednisone. I don't keep patients indefinitely on corticosteroids. But you need to assess at every visit down the road is still if the prednisone spraying agent is required. And you have to monitor those patients if you use those medications to look for hepatotoxicity or leukopenias, which is important. Patients may not respond properly to immunosuppressive therapy if they have advanced airway center fibrosis in patients who have emphysema, which is a complication described in patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis among non-smokers, or in patients with advanced progressive lung fibrosis. However, patients may respond to immunosuppressive therapy if they have non-fibrotic disease, if they have extensive ground glass changes on imaging as shown here, because this appears to be uh, associated with a high index of cellularity or patients who have evidence of BAL lymphocytosis or evidence of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia on biopsy. I am showing you here the placebo group of the inbuilt trial. These were patients with progressive fibrosin ILD, including HP patients who had evidence of functional imaging and clinical decline. And if you don't do anything on those patients when they come to your clinic, you likely will see that they may have almost 200 ml CC loss on lung function on FPC over a year. So those patients may have an IPF, an idiopathic lung fibrosis like clinical course. Therefore, the importance of considering using an antifibrotic uh, medication like nincadinib, which was found to slow the rate of decline in FPC by nearly 50% compared to the placebo group. It's also important um, to look for uh, comorbidities and screen and treat them because they can affect the quality of life and the survival of uh, the patient. The approach to any patient with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis is not just isolate to anti avoidance and or using medications, but requires a interdisciplinary approach. You need to manage the symptoms, educate about smoking cessation, provide all necessary vaccinations, provide oxygen supplementation, which might not be a big deal in your country, but it's a big deal where I am because uh, I am at a 5,000 feet in Colorado. Many patients uh, walk into my clinic with low oxygen saturation. And these are some of the things that we do in clinic. There is one comorbidity that you need to screen and look for and consider therapy if possible, and that is pulmonary hypertension because last year in health, treprostinil was uh, found to be beneficial in patients with pulmonary hypertension due to underlying interstitial lung disease. It improved the six minute walk distance and decreased the occurrence of clinical worsening. And at least in the US is approved, always a very expensive medication. In summary, what I mean trying to tell you is that Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a complex lung disease and an important cause of lung fibrosis. The disease should be classified as non-fibrotic or fibrotic and according to the anti-exposure likelihood. The diagnosis should be patient-centered and stepwise based on probabilistic reasoning and based on multi-scenario discussion, team approach. Anti-specific testing are not diagnostic tool. They will not help you rule in or rule out the disease and they are not a substitute for a good history and using also an exposure questionnaire. anti avoidance is always key. And sometimes if the patient develops disease progression despite anti avoidance and it has wrong glass opacities on imaging or VL lymphocytosis, um, early on you may consider anti-inflammatory therapy. And in patients with a progressive fibrosing phenotype because they do badly, you may consider offering those patients an antifibrotic medication if possible.
And I'm gonna stop here. Thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for the very kind invitation.